And since I had to turn it off. It is so good to see you all here today. Uh, wow, what a change in days, huh? Uh, beautiful weather outside, but it's so great to see you here. And I'm so glad that you are here with us today. Um, you'll notice if you're here for the first time or you haven't ever filled this out and you would like to let us know who you are, there is a special insert in the bulletin for visitors, and it is a great way for us to get to know you. So I hope you'll fill that out and put it in the offering plate. Our offering plates are in the very back in, the, in the, uh, what we call the narthex. And in this hallway right here is uh, where we leave our offerings unless we're using the mail or giving online. That's one of those uh, remnants of the uh, pandemic that still is with us. We don't pass plates, and as you can see with communion, we do it in a safe sort of way too. The one thing that we'll ask is, is that you will remember before you come up and grab a cup and grab a cup of bread and a cup of, of, of juice that you have taken your mask off first. Um, because if not, you won't be able to take it off. So you'll be sitting there like this. So that's why it's important that we always remind people of that. I just want to say welcome to you all. And I also want you to uh, say welcome once again to our guest preacher today, Reverend Jackie McHenry. She is here on behalf of our Women's Week. Um, every year in the first week of March, we celebrate Maybe some of you know the International Day for Women is Tuesday. Uh, the United Church of Christ and many other denominations recognize the role of women in the church in all of their varying forms, and Jackie will be our representative today for that very purpose. And so I hope that you'll want to be a part of that as well. So with that said, I want to turn your attention to announcements, and we have several and I want to make sure that you hear them as quickly as I can send them for you. But today we have a great, wonderful day going on. Um, after worship today, uh, there are going to be some different meetings going on today. And youth are meeting tonight and bells are meeting tonight. But in the meantime, in between, around 2.30 today, I know the weather's going to be nice, but it's going to be nicer in here. Because we're going to be having our second of three recitals. And the, uh, the organist, the official organist for Elon University, Tom Jones, who's been a sub here on numerous occasions, is going to be our guest organist for the day. And I think you will be very pleased you came. I hope you will share this with neighbors and friends and invite them to come. I think it only lasts, what, about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, right? Is, is that correct, Stephen? Do you know? Yes, yeah, about 45. Yeah. So it's not a long time, but it is worth coming and being a part, you will have been, you will feel like you have received something very, very special, a very special gift. So I hope you will do that. Also, after worship today, one of our deacon groups, the Orange, if you're in the Orange Deacon Group, that's led by our deacon, Russ Martin, is meeting in person, which is a new thing. We're meeting in person in the CLC for a brief meeting. So if you're in that Orange Deacon group and would like to meet one another in, by, by face, uh, please come down to the CLC today. Then, later today, of course, the youth are meeting and they're getting ready to, say, to get ready for their service for next week. And then we have a very busy week ahead. Um, this week, we are going to have a quilt show in our CLC. Now, usually we don't talk about when groups come in and do uh, something, but this is about art. And one of the things that our church values in terms of its spiritual practices is beauty. And beauty as, is rested in art. Art is a part of this quilt show. And we hope that you may, once again, talk to your neighbors and friends and have them come down and see what will be on display this week uh, it starts on Wednesday, goes through Friday, or actually through Saturday, and it was, they're from 10 to 4. I think Saturday is just a little shorter, but I hope that you will want to come and be a part of that and experience this for the first time. This is the first time that this quilt show has been in Elon, and we are hoping that it stays here. So we want to also all play a part. But also on Monday is our Women's Fellowship General Meeting, and that general meeting means that 
we're going to have a special speaker. The Reverend Julie Peoples from Congregational UCC in Greensboro is going to be here with some lay people to talk about their experience of resettling Afghan refugees. And so because this meeting is so important and so special, it is during the day, which we know uh, uh, prohibits some of you, but if you're not generally a part or have not regularly been a part of Women's Fellowship, you are invited. All are welcome to that event. And it starts at 1030 uh, tomorrow morning. As you leave today, I hope you will leave this way. We have two tables full of our wonderful Elon Community Church t-shirts. And some of you have never gotten one. And we have many different sizes available. We hope you will go down and look. We have a student volunteer, Julia, who will be down there to receive you and talk with you about what size you'd like to wear and if you want to make a donation. We're not charging a fee. We're charging a donation. And we're just asking that you would give what you want because these t-shirts we've had for quite a while. You've seen some of us wearing them. On the back it says, Be the Church. On the front it says, Elon Community Church. We hope that you'll want, if you've not had one, or yours is worn out, you might want to get another one. And so we hope that you'll want to be a part of that as well. Pretty full week because now we're going to be also into our Lenten daily uh, meditations. And if you have not had a chance, you can go to Facebook Live and it's recorded there. We have a meditation every Wednesday and it gives for a whole week. This week we're doing finding your time, finding your space. And we're asking only for five minutes of quiet time and it will be directed over the next several weeks. But this week is just about finding that time, taking that extra five minutes and giving yourself that little extra space uh, during this season of Lent. There's other um, announcements to share and I'll leave those for you. And if I forget any, I'll remind you at Joys and Concerns. Let's prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship service. Good morning, everyone. Would those that are able please rise and help me with the call of worship? We may be entering this season arid, dry from pain and injustices. God is still hydrating our spirits. We may be wondering, feeling as if we have no direction. Yet God is guiding us in the wilderness. We may be fearful, wondering what comes next. And yet God is surrounding us with peace.
Please join me in the prayer of reflection and growth. God of the road, we journey together into the wilderness again. Doubts will creep in as we seek your presence. At times, we will slide away from our responsibilities to care for our neighbors. Keep awake, you call to us, and so we ask ourselves, will hurtful words from others taunt us and inhibit our growth with you? Will negative images in our minds draw us away from our practices? Will we snooze to the needs of this world and ignore the pain in our communities? Deliver us from the temptations of this world and the tests that we impose upon ourselves. Amen. When we wander throughout this Lenten journey, God follows us even into the depths of the wilderness. Forgiveness abounds, and we grow and discover in the midst of Christ's salvation. Thanks be to God. Please join me in greeting each other with a wave of peace. You may be seated. The first scripture is from the New Testament, Paul's letter to the Romans. It'll be found on page 156 in your pew Bibles in the New Testament. It starts at chapter 10 verses 8 through 13. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified. And one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Through this scripture, God is still speaking. come down and be a part of my children's sermon? No? Nope. Okay, that's fine. You're, you're, you're perfectly fine. So I'm going to talk to the camera as well as to you today, and I have something I want to show you. Our flowers today represent something very special. There's been a lot of talk about sunflowers lately and about, you might have already started to see kids that there's daffodils growing out of the ground and spring is kind of coming forward. And so there's a lot of yellow in the flowers today. There's also a reminder to us that this means new life and new hope. Oh, let me take this off so you can see my lips. And new hope. So I hope that you see this special flower. We actually set this out especially uh, for the family that was already sponsoring today because yellow, of course, is also the color of uh, a country called Ukraine. And we know that that is something that we're all, that's all been on our mind about a people who have been under attack. And so it's, it's a, another reminder. I know that maybe some of you, through the time when you've been here for different reasons, saw all the doves that are hanging in, our, uh, in the front atrium of our church. We had those up for Advent, 
we had them up just before Christmas, and we were going to take them down after Christmas. And then we thought, well, we'll leave them up for Epiphany, because Epiphany is a season of peace, and then we were going to take them down. And the quilters were coming. We were going to hang one of the quilts up on the, on the, uh, uh, up on the top of that, and we were going to leave that. Well, we knew that there was at least one week uh, that we had before the quilt show this coming week, so we thought we'd leave them up. Well, the quilter said to us, we would much rather have the doves up there than a quilt. And so they asked, would you please keep them up? And we said, we will. Those are a thousand doves that were folded by our friend Tom Connell. And Tom did that as a way and an act of peace, and we are so thankful for that. But there is something that you've got to know. I'm going to have to come up a little closer to tell you. Guess what? Somebody added some other folds down there. There's more folds, but these time they're cranes like they were from Japan, and they're blue and yellow. And I thought, at first when I saw it, I went, what are these? And then it dawned on me that it was about trying to remember that we are working for peace for all people. And you know, kids, it's not always easy because we hear a lot of bad stories. We hear about things where people are not always nice to each other, where people aren't always kind. And yet, we as followers of Christ understand that we stand with all people who seek that kind of peace. And so I hope that we'll remember that today as we're coming into this time. And so when you see these yellow flowers, I want that to mean something to you, and I wanted you to see that today. Did you see it back there too? I hope so. Okay, and I had some new kids just come in, and I'm sorry, we're just in the middle of our children's time. So, but we're so glad you're here. We're so glad everyone is here today. And so this is our prayer today. So can I pause for a moment of prayer? Dear God, thank you for reminding us of your peace. You help us through all times and even our problems, and you bring us peace. And we're reminded of the peace that we pray for, for all in the world. And these yellow flowers represent that today. Be with us, O oh God. Help us to find that peace. Amen. And now I present to you our friend, associate member, so I always say that she's part of this community in so many ways, and when we asked her to come, she says, when Elon calls, she says, I come. And I'm so pleased. And so I want to reintroduce you to our friend, Reverend Dr. Jackie McHenry. Amen, amen. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Hear these words from the Gospel of Luke. Thank you. Amen. That's right, they're trying to take my beauty away. I Hear these words from the Gospel of Luke, the fourth chapter. I'll be reading verses 1 through 13. Hear these words. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live by bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, 
I will give you the authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will be all yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, we thank you, God, for this day that you've given us. Lord, we ask right now that this word, this homily, this sermon will fall on the hearts of the people, that they may hear the message that comes forth. Allow them to see thee and not me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. It is such a pleasure and a privilege to be in your presence once again. It's been a minute uh, that, you know, the pandemic has just separated us all out, but we praise God that we're still here. We're still on the top side of the soil. <laughs> we're still hanging tough. And I bless the Lord for this opportunity. And I thank God for, I see some of my family members have come sitting all the way in the back. My babies are waving. All right. Thank God. And I see Miss Barbara who has come with me from our church, True Community. And I bless God for all of you who are here today. Anytime Randy Orwig needs me, he knows I'm going to say yes. And so I bless the Lord for this privilege. And I understand that I am um, sort of representing the women for, what is this, what is it, Women's Week. Yes, okay, so what I'm going to do, okay, I celebrate all of my sisters in the house. Amen. And so what I'm going to do, let's let the brothers see, you know, all the sisters, every woman that can stand, stand up today, all the sisters, and those that cannot stand, just wave your hand, wave your hand. And I want the men that that's right, give us a big round of applause. Look at all these sisters here, because church could not happen without the women. Amen. 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 Bless God. Thank you. Thank you for that. This morning, I want to share in this Lucan text during this Lenten season, lessons learned in the wilderness moment. Lessons learned in that wilderness moment. So during the Lent season, the church often focuses on repentance, resisting temptation, and the passion of Jesus. Today's text reminds us that our capacity to repent, resist temptation, comes from the relationship that we have with God and the grace of his deliverance rather than from our own strength and our own initiative. You do know that without the presence of the Holy Spirit, we could not accomplish anything. This text of temptation in the wilderness comes with a backstory uh, and it's really important to see 
what was going on in Luke's gospel prior to the temptation story in the fourth chapter. For it sets the scene and it sets the tone today. It sets the scene and, the scene and the tone for the confrontation and the outcome with the devil. You got to be ready when you go toe to toe with the devil. You got to know what's going on. Most of us know this story in the fourth chapter of Luke, and we reread it every Lenten season. But today I want to offer some deep, deep lessons learned out of Jesus' wilderness experience that will help all of us on our Christian journey in real time. So the backstory is like this. We were introduced to Jesus in the third chapter of Luke's gospel where it simply states, he is the son of God who will bring salvation to both the Jews and the Gentiles. Luke 3.22 says Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. But we don't want to miss some powerful points of interest surrounding Luke's gospel and the account of Jesus' baptism. Let me just kind of run down some things. Jesus prayed at his baptism. This is in keeping with Luke's goal to present Christ as the Son of Man who is ever dependent on his Father. Luke is always trying to get us to understand we can do nothing of our own selves. We are dependent on God the Father and Christ the Son. The prayer life of our Lord is a dominant theme in this gospel as prayer must be dominant, a dominant activity in our own lives. Here's the proof. Jesus prayed at the outset of his public ministry. Before he even got started, he prayed about his ministry. Jesus prayed when he was becoming well known and the crowds were following him everywhere. Jesus spent a whole night in prayer before choosing his 12 disciples. We really need to look at that because sometimes in churches, we just choose people willy-nilly and it doesn't work out well. Jesus prayed all night long about his 12 disciples. Jesus prayed on the Mount of Transfiguration. He prayed in the presence of his disciples and this prayer called forth a discourse on prayer that we all know about. You know it well. Lord, the Bible tells us, teach us to pray. And then Jesus started saying, our Father who art in heaven. But that was because the disciples saw him praying, and that's how he taught them. Jesus predicted Peter's denial and Peter's backsliding and prayed for him that his faith would not fail. Jesus prayed so intensely in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know that story, just before the crucifixion. They said he prayed so hard that his sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. Jesus was a praying man, amen? amen. His life, Jesus is his life, his character, his ministry, is our paradigm, it's our model. So if Jesus prayed about everything, then don't you think we need to do the same thing? Amen. Another point of interest at the baptism of Jesus is all three persons of the Trinity are found at Jesus' baptism. If you look in Luke 3, 21 and 22, it says when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. The Trinity was in the house, amen? amen? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So we pick up the story 
in today's text, Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 13, with Jesus preparing for a close, up close, and personal encounter with the devil. I don't know if you've ever went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil, but that ain't no joke. Verse 1 says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. We can stop right there. Stop right there. This iconic statement is the hallmark of Christianity and discipleship. It says, Jesus was filled with God's Spirit. We live in an ever-changing global world that leads us and lures us and seduces us and persuades us and deceives us into following the latest fad, which oftentimes turns out to be fleeting and empty. The other challenge is, is our carnality, our flesh, whose desire is to be self-centered, self-indulging, self-aggrandizing due to our inherited Adamic nature. We did come from Adam, and you know he messed up. This is why Apostle Paul said, we must die to the flesh. Well, how often, Paul? He said, we must die daily. Every day, we have to fight the urge, and we must be filled with the Spirit. And being filled with the Spirit means to be completely yielded, completely obedient to every word of God. Because you see, the flesh wants to dominate. We know, if the truth be told, all of us, we want to dominate, we want to control. It wants to call all the shots. The flesh wants to make all the decisions. But the Spirit of God cannot fill you if you are full of yourself. When we are filled with God's Spirit, then we allow the Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to speak through us and reflect the Christ in us. We're not going to just follow anything or do anything anybody says, anybody that comes up. We are going to hear from God and we will do what the Lord say do. So verses 2 and 3 said Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. Now there are times in our journey where God's Spirit leads us into places of hardship and testing. Situations that are so tough sometimes that we cry out, why God? Why me God? Why this? I don't know. Is there anybody else in here ever had to cry out to God, Lord, why me? We don't understand what's happening, and it's hard. We're confused. Sometimes we're even angry. I'm the first one, and I will admit that I have been angry with God. I didn't understand what is going on. Why? This hurts God. What? But God gently reminds us to trust him. You can hear him saying, if you would only trust me through the heartache, trust me through the tears and the loneliness. God is whispering, trust me, I will carry you through it all. And guess what? He does. So listen, I understand that the psalmist also tells us, he leads me beside the still waters. We like that, Psalm 23. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. We like that. Sounds good. Sounds caring. But sometimes the Holy Spirit leads us into difficult situations, into times of trials and times of testing. But guess what? God never leaves us hanging or helpless to fend for ourselves. He never does that. He is an ever-present help in the time of trouble because he's there to strengthen us, to even carry us through whatever, whatever the challenge may be. And scripture supports this because God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The psalmist supports the idea when he said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because thou art 
with me. Huh, church, God is always with us, whether you believe it or not, whether you feel it or not. God is always with us. He loves us that much. Even his Hebrew name is a testament to his action. They call him Emmanuel, God with us. He's always with us. So Jesus was led into the wilderness for 40 days, long time. He was hungry, he was exhausted, and he was vulnerable. The devil who tempted Adam and Eve in the garden is also the same fella that tempted Jesus in the wilderness. So the devil is a major character in this text. So allow me to share a little spiritual warfare 101 just for some clarity's sake so that you can understand what Jesus was up against. First of all, Satan is a real being. Somebody ought to say amen. He's real, y'all. He is not a symbol or an idea. He is more than a doctrine. He is a danger. In the word of God, the person of the devil is as clearly defined as the person of Jesus Christ. So if we accept his powerful testimony of Christ and eternal life, then how can we ignore the unveiling of the devil and hell? If we question the revelation of Satan, then we're also attacking the trust of Christ. I say that because the Bible declares them both with equal force. The enemy, the devil, the serpent was in the Garden of Eden in the beginning. And there is mention of him throughout the 66 books all the way to Revelation. Jesus was there in the beginning as the Trinity was, and all the way to Revelation and in between. So you can't have good and not have evil. And you can't have evil and not have good. Are you following with me, church? Take note now. Just look at Satan's resume here. First of all, this is his origin in heaven. Let's go there. He was the great angel created perfect and good by the Lord. And then he was vested in every grace and anointed as the guardian of God's glory. Satan was the delight of the Lord. He was the, he was the party up there. He was the delight of the Lord. He was at home in the presence of the Lord, of God. His name at that time was Lucifer, which the Greek translation means day star or bright star. He was gorgeous. He was beautiful. He illuminated. He shined, hence the name Lucifer, bright star. He wore righteousness uncomfortably and holiness. His holiness was personified. He led the angels in open praise and adoration of the Most High God. This is the origin of who we know as the devil. So what happened? All this was going on in heaven, so what happened? Well, what was Satan's sin? Let's look at it. It was his free will decision to exalt himself against God. Satan rebelled against the known will of God. Not a good thing to do. Satan, and, um, which means adversary, because his name got changed from being the bright star to being the enemy, and that's why we often refer to the evil one as the enemy. Satan means enemy, adversary. He became enamored with his own beauty. He got the big head, y'all. He is enamored with his own beauty. He was impressed with his wisdom, and he exalted. He was exalted by the importance of his job. Today, we might call that narcissism. I don't know. The devil became delusional in thinking he could be just like God. He deceived a multitude of lesser angels into following his rebellion against God. You know misery loves company. They're not going out by themselves. They're going to take some of us with them. So he took a third of the angels from heaven, and we now know them as fallen angels or demons or principalities and powers, as Paul referred them to be. Watch out 
for arrogant people who are full of themselves. That's a spirit. Watch out. Everything about them is I, I, I. Me, myself, and mine. That's an arrogant spirit. People who believe that everybody else is inferior to them, who are always flaunting their skills and their uh, possessions and their credentials and their salaries. Beware of people like that. Look at the resume of the evil one. Luke 10, 18 states, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Needless to say, the enemy and this group of demons or fallen angels, they got kicked out of hell, heaven. They were expelled from heaven. And the book of John states that Satan's assignment is to kill, steal, and destroy anything that gets in his way, anything that he goes for. And this is just a drop in the bucket, church, regarding the enemy and spiritual warfare. It'll almost take a weekend workshop to talk about <laughs> Satan. So this just kind of gives you a brief synopsis so that you can understand and unpack the works of the evil one. Satan is, let me, and I'll end it with this in, in this portion, Satan is overqualified to deal with humanity. He has at least 7,000 years experience in dealing with human weakness. Apart from the Holy Spirit, we are no match for the devil. Somebody ought to say amen now. We are no match without God's Spirit. Try to roll up on him with your degree from your university. He will eat you up and spit you out. <laughs> now, so you begin to see the critical significance in that opening verse in Luke 4 and 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit. The Savior knew he was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the devil. He knew. He knew this wilderness experience would attack his identity. You know, because Satan's like, oh, so if you are the son of God. He knew because the enemy attacks us and attacks our identity. Jesus knew Satan would try to get him to bow and worship him. The enemy does that today. Don't go to church. Don't go over there and fool with them people. They don't like you anyway. Come and just go hang out with me. Satan is always trying to recruit us to do something bad or do something evil. Beware of that. Jesus knew that the enemy was trying to test him and, and that um, this was occurring when Jesus was at his worst. He was weak, he was tired, he was famished, and he was vulnerable. But his clap back at Satan was a strong, consistent, it is written, Jesus swung the word of God at him, and that's what we have to do in situations when we don't have the capacity, then we take and we answer with what? The word of God. I know a lot of us want to answer with some four-letter words, me too sometimes, but we have to use the word of God. That's what Jesus did. His clap back, it is written, you cannot, you cannot, Test the Lord God. Satan, who do you think you are? Who do you think you're talking to? But what that says, if the evil one rolled up on Jesus in his face, what do you think the evil one is going to do with us? And some of us have had experience. He gave the devil Every single time, Jesus gave the devil the immutable word of God. So I say to you as I conclude this, we may be in a wilderness season. I understand that. I know about that. We might be in a season, a wilderness of loneliness. We might be in a wilderness of doubt, of fear, of debt, of depression, guilt, grief, temptation, but Jesus has left us with some lessons learned in his wilderness. And so 
what I implore you to do, what I admonish you to do in the weeks to come. Think about this text. Think about this little sermon. And what you need to do, read the word, because Jesus kept saying what? It is written. So when situations cloud in on you and you don't know what else to do, you just don't have any more answers, read the word, speak the word, pray the word, trust the word, and then what? Live by the word. The next thing we need to do a lesson, and by all means, church, we got to pray. Not only when crisis comes on our doorstep, but pray when things are going well. Say, Lord, I thank you. Lord, you didn't have to do that today, but God, I thank you so much. And when you wake up in the morning, before your feet hit the floor, you want to say, Lord, thank you for another day. He didn't have to wake you up. A lot of folk didn't wake up. But we just say, thank you, pray, talk to the Lord, let him know how much you love him. Let him know how much you appreciate him. Big decisions, yes, pray. Little minor things that you need to figure out, you tell God about it, ask God about it. None of us, at this juncture, none of us know what's coming, right? We don't know what tomorrow holds. The Ukrainians, the Ukrainian people, they didn't know last week what was coming and that their whole world would be turned upside down. This is not the time to disconnect from church or God. Pray. What else did Jesus teach us? Know your adversary, okay? The devil is on the prowl, seeking whom he may devour. He don't care. Be on guard, church, because the evil does not care. Evil has no morals. Fight back with God's power. Not your flesh, not your thoughts, not your intellect, but with the power of God and the Holy Spirit. So I just say as I leave, this is not just another Lenten season. Life has and is continuously changing. I was so annoyed the other day because I saw the price tag of gas as I was driving and it was $3 and 59 cent, and I just got an attitude. And I'm like, I'm just going to go and get to the next station, and I'm going to find me some gas. Somebody got it for 333 still. And by the time I finished wasting more gas, the, the price was 379. <laughs> and then I had to tuck it in and buy the gas. I was mad, but I had to buy it, right? This morning coming in, the gas at Harris Teeter was 389. Life is different now. When have I ever been to the grocery store and a bag of oranges was $9.34? I got another attitude. What in the world is going on? We don't know what's coming. But what we know is the God whose hand we can hold on to. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. He knows the future. We don't know nothing but what's today. And so I say with you, to you at this time, take these wilderness lessons and apply them to your life. Stick with Jesus, church. That's the only thing that's going to work. Stick with Jesus because you'll never, never lose. God is always there. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Let the church say amen. Thank you. Thank you. And she's going to be with us as we share in communion in just a few moments. You know, we are a people called to hear the word of God in so many ways. And today we have heard the word. Thank you. Amen. And it is a joy to be able to celebrate all that is going to be taking place over the next few weeks and months, it is enjoyable to also know that we in community together can do wondrous things. And we're going to keep finding ways to do that. We're going to keep finding ways to be faithful in all that we do.
and that is a joy. But we do have some concerns. Generally, we find in our concerns those people who are grieving, those people who find themselves for one reason or another sick or having undergone surgery or are recovering, and we're mindful of all of them. And because we're online, we don't always say everybody's name, but there's a couple I do want to lift up, and that is our friend Linda, Linda Brown. She is getting a little stronger each day, and I'm just hoping that you will continue to support her. And I just want to say a special thanks to Sue. Uh, she's done a great job of helping to line up help for her. Uh, we have another new member, Liz, Liz Freeman. And some of you have met her and know her, but she's already had uh, been undergone surgery, and she's home. She's sore. It's a knee replacement. She had it before, so she kind of knew what she was expecting. Her daughter's with her now, but we want to just be there with her in prayer. And you know, I'm just so thankful you brought up Ukraine and just the idea that, you know, when we call to prayer, we think somehow, well, is that all we can do? I'm telling you that that prayer is important. Let us find ourselves praying each and every day for a sense of peace and understanding. And let it change us, and let's pray that it changes others as well. And let us be reminded over and over again that as the people of God, we have the very task to be the kind of people that can even fight the devil and that can remember that God is with us. God is with us as we go to prayer even now. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for this time. Thank you for helping us to celebrate this week. Once again, celebrating women in ministry because so often it is something that is ignored. We in our own temptations find ourselves looking in places that we shouldn't, taking credit for things that are not ours. For we know, God, that they are yours. And all that we can do, all that we can be, all that we are, comes to your guidance and your leading. So be with us as we celebrate in that joy. Be with us as we celebrate in the joy of having all kinds of different experiences together, of growing and working together, of searching out what it means to be hospitable and welcome, of creating a just world for all. We pray, O oh God, that you will remind us in the midst of all that we face, in the midst of our grief, in the midst of our concerns, in the midst of those fears, in the midst of our own temptations, that you will be there. Be with Linda, be with Liz, be with all those who we've been praying for throughout the weeks and the months who are continuing to recover from all the things that they are involved in, the people who are grieving even now. Be with them now. Give them your peace. As we pray for these things and those things that rest upon our heart, we pray now in this moment of silence. Be with us in this moment. And as we are reminded by it is written, we pray these things in the name of Christ who taught us to pray when he said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Even though we've been doing offering differently, we still offer our gifts and our talents and our time to God even now. Let us do so as we remember this in this time of our offering.
Let us pray. O oh God, be with us as we bless all that we are about to give, all that we have given, and all that is presented to us on this table, even this day. We pray your blessing on all that we do and dedicate all that we give to you. In the name and love of Jesus the Christ, amen. May God be with you. And also with you. We lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the living God. In the midst of our Lenten journey, we are asked to see another way, a way that doesn't cause temptation, but that can transform the world. Come now to eat and drink. You are a part of God's community of witness and hope. We are the body of Christ. We are called to be God's people. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. All are welcome here. You may be seated. When Jesus was with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it. And as he broke it, he shared it with his disciples saying, Take and eat, for this is my body broken for you for the sin of the world. Take and eat, and as often as you do, do it in remembrance of me. Jesus said unto his disciples, this is the new covenant of my blood. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And now, all things are ready. Come forward as you are able. The ushers will bring you forward. We all come this way, and then you'll go back around to your seats. And we ask first that the deacons who are going to be serving would please come forward. This is the very presence of God. This is Emmanuel, God with us in Christ. In the bread that we eat, in the cup that we drink from, his presence is with us and is shared at this table in this time. Take and eat and drink in his name. And know that God is with you in all that you do. God is with you whatever you experience God is with you in the midst of all you must face. For this is the bread and cup of the new covenant. A covenant that shapes us and shapes all that we are. As you eat and drink, know that we are joined together in love joined together in the love of Christ who leads us and guides us in all that we do. Take and eat. Take and drink. For this meal sets us free. Free to be gods. Free to share in love and mercy free to know a peace that passes understanding. As you eat and drink, know that God is with you in all that you do. For this is the presence of Christ in our lives. As we approach this table, be reflective on the ultimate sacrifice that Christ did for each of us. We are here of what he did on Calvary's cross. He suffered. 
suffered. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was spat upon. They broke him down or they tried to, all because he loved us so much. And as you enjoy and take of this cup and of this bread, continue to remind yourself of how much the Lord loves us and wants to be in relationship with you. Know that this bread and cup gives to us a new sense of what the world holds, for we see it in God's eyes. We see it under the shadow of God's wondrous arm, of God's wondrous love. As you receive this bread and drink of this cup, we are joined together to know that God is with us no matter what we face, no matter what changes take place, no matter what unexpected turns happen, God is near, giving us a new sense of strength, giving us the ability to see and to know with new eyes, to hear with new ears, to act as God would have us do. This is the Lord's table. It's not the church's table. It's not pastor's table. It's the Lord's table. And he's here at his table as we approach whatever it is that you need. It's at this table. If you need joy, it's at the table. If you need peace, it's at the table. Certainly love is at the table. He says, come and sup with me. I invite you in relationship with me. I came down just for you. If it was only you, I would have died just for you. That's how much he loves us. What a fellowship and what a joy that we have knowing that we are connected together at this table. Knowing that as we face our wildernesses, as we go with Christ, seeing that he has shown us the way, we receive this bread and this cup. And on the night before his betrayal, on the night before the denial, just before his trial and as his own crucifixion, Christ ate with his disciples. He filled his disciples as he fills us now. Fills us with a spirit of love. Fills us with a spirit of strength and hope. We are the people of God because the table calls us to this place and allows us to be refreshed, renewed, and strengthened. This is the bread. This is the cup. There is enough for all. There is an abundance at this table. It's an abundance that allows this table to be welcoming to all. No matter who you are, no matter where you are on life's journey. This is God's table.
dear God. We thank you for this moment where we were able to come at your invitation to share in this table. God, for all of the people that came down this aisle to share, God, whatever that was on their hearts, whatever was in their spirit, meet them at the deepest level of their being, oh God. Some did come looking for joy, looking for restoration. God, touch the people in this place as they have remembered your covenant. They've remembered the things that you've said. They've reflected on the fact that you went to the cross on their behalf. We love you so much, God, and we give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor for the sacrifice that you made on behalf of human, humanity. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We have had a wonderful worship on this day. Thank you so much for your invitation that I may come and stand before you. It has been my honor. We bless the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the worship celebration. We felt your presence in this place, God. We felt your anointing even in the music, at the table, in the word, oh God. Everything that happened, oh God, we felt you as Emmanuel, God, with us. Remind the people that you will never leave them nor forsake them. And whatever it is that they go through, whatever the wilderness is, God, show them that you will be right there carrying them and rocking them in the cradle of your love. This is our prayer on this Sabbath day in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 